Hello everyone, and welcome to episode number one of Radio Odell, where I bring you good tidings from interesting people, and uh, I'm your host, Chris Odell. All right, so today we have uh, a friend of mine and someone who I've worked with uh, quite a bit in the past. His name is Antro Ali. He was born in Finland, I believe, oh, back in 1952, but you wouldn't know his age uh, uh, without me telling you, as he keeps a pretty youthful and uh, independent spirit about him. He has, uh, he has written a, num a number of books, including his version of The Eight Circuit Brain, which you might have heard of uh, via Timothy Leary or Robin on Tom Wilson. He was uh, friends with them, and he's got his own sort of take on that system. Uh, he has done a number of paratheatrical works and regular theater as well. We'll get into what paratheater is during the podcast. It's definitely interesting and different. Um, he has also done, oh boy, uh, it, produced, directed, written uh, about almost 20 movies, I think now, and I worked with him on, uh, boy, probably, I don't know, 15 or so of those as, a, as an editor and sometimes helping out in other ways. Uh, that was that was a fun process. I really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, I used to be a professional uh, editor and uh, and videographer back in the day. My old career, uh, I miss it a little bit, but mostly because of working with really interesting people like him. He had some even when I didn't necessarily care for the subject matter uh, of the film or, or the movie. There, I still enjoyed working with him very much. He has a, a very unique way of thinking, and uh, and and he, you know a different take on on a lot of things. And I. I think he's uh i think he's got some wisdom to share so without uh further ado let's get into the podcast and uh we'll see what you guys think oh and, and keep in mind for any reason you don't like this episode we're gonna be doing all kinds of different people and all kinds of different subjects so if you're not into this one yeah you know let it go go to the next one we're probably gonna release them as a batch because we are here in the quarantine times at the moment so i know people are uh starved for uh for content i suppose well probably not starved for content but you might want some something interesting uh to think about anyway and there's tons of content out there but i hope to be uh, providing something that's uh, not only entertaining but also useful in your personal development. All right, here we go. Antro, uh, welcome, welcome to the new show. You were on the, the my older podcast a couple times, and uh, welcome back, sort of. Uh, well, thank thank you. Sort of, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Well, the welcome's definitely definitely welcome. Yeah. So <laughs> I figured. <laughs> in fact, I think you may be the first episode again because I always uh, we started off the last one with you, and I I always enjoy our conversation. So uh, maybe we'll get this one out uh, as the uh, the premiere episode. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yes, how, how are uh, how are you doing? I'm sure I'm going to tell people in the introduction that we're in the uh, the strange quarantine times, but. Uh, um, how are, how are things going for you up there? Um, things are going well. Uh, you know, Sylvia and I are both in our, uh, mid to late sixties, uh, but we're pretty healthy for our age and, you know, we're, um, you know, I guess sheltering in place like, um, many other people, but the thing is, it hasn't really been that different for us. You know, we're kind of married hermits to start with and typically <laughs> socially, isolated uh, as part of our everyday life. So the only, you know, real change is that we haven't been in, uh, going out to restaurants and, but that's, or, or concerts. We like to go to concerts too. But, yes. But what it has done, it has kind of, um, you know, forced uh, some really interesting developments in our creative and artistic uh, collaborations in uh, playing and recording some new music and, um, I'm going to be working with uh, our friend Michael McWhorter to create a kind of uh, CGI version of a music video of a new song that we just um, uh, came out with. And so hopefully that'll be uh, posted on YouTube in you know, a week or two. We'll see. Yeah, that's great. No, that's good. I kind of I had a feeling uh, for you it might not, if anything, it might affect you positively because you'll have some clear clear space and time to uh to get a lot of work done so um yeah so that's that's good i think i think i'm noticing that this is yeah having a less of a of, of a poor effect if at all uh on certainly on the more artistic types i have a friend who's sort of a um a dj composer other things but he's been 
he's been just cranking out work like crazy and doing live streams and even showing people sometimes his process of how he's making his music and things like that. So it's, uh, it's been a, it's been an interesting time. It's certainly a struggle for a lot of people who were kind of integrated into the more normal system of society or who rely on income. Even yeah, folks that work at restaurants, uh, music, well, normally musicians are having a hard time. The ones that tour for money, that's for sure. Um, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're in a, a difficult place. Well, but, uh, I think I think anybody's going to be in a really difficult place if they bank too much on that word "normal." Um, yeah. I don't think there's going to be any return to normal um, at all. In fact, uh, nobody really knows when this thing's going to pass over. You know, it could be a couple of weeks, it could be a couple of months, but there's been this. You know, the way I kind of am starting to look at it is there's been this mm-hmm. um, kind of giant reset button that's been pushed Mm. and in that reset which we're in this kind of reset period um you have the opportunity instead of constantly recycling you know in your old habits trying to make things go back to normal you also have the opportunity to start um rethinking your life and maybe even rethinking thinking so that you Mm -hmm. you know can become more aware of uh, maybe certain beliefs, certain assumptions, certain ideas that um, you've basically outgrown, but you didn't, you weren't aware that you outgrew them, and so you've been mired in this kind of stagnant, wheel sp- wheel spinning uh, situation for years. And sometimes it takes this kind of massive stopping of the world to begin seeing where we have been um, treadmilling, where we have been going in circles because there's been so much of that the world has kind of gone Mm -hmm. uh you know uh out of control in a lot of ways and this reset has kind of put the brakes on um in a lot of ways and uh one of the great things about it is is that the um you know there's less air pollution now obviously (laughs) yes um and and the Mm -hmm. waters are the water is starting to clear up more and and I'm thinking mm-hmm. also the wildlife, you know, animals, you know, who aren't being hunted out of, out of you know, into extinction, you know, they're, they're having, um, you know, a second chance, you know, to propagate or whatever. And mm-hmm. I was just looking at some video down in, um, I think it was either Chile or Venezuela, where, um, you know, just like in many big cities, you know, around the world, uh, mm-hmm. it's like a ghost town. But down there, you're seeing mountain lions basically roaming the streets <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah they've they've got to be wondering what's going on oh, okay those guys finally died out i guess we're gonna take back over <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah basically they were here first yeah it is it is interesting i wonder if there's i'm sure in some places it might be a bit of a trick when people do get back to society they're gonna have to figure out how to uh how to push these uh these guys back out a little bit so we at least don't get eaten walking around but uh but yeah some of the other animals it's nice to see it's nice to see everything kind of get a little break and I, I gotta say i mean even though our air pollution is usually very minimal here last night i was out looking at the stars and i mean i i can't remember the last time it was that clear i mean it was just it was crystal clear it was really a really quite a quite a treat that way and i and, and i do think it even when we go back i hope I would hope that a lot of people would go, okay, we're, you know, was all this driving back and forth, having to go into the office all the time, having to take, uh, you know, a lot of plane flights for short meetings, things like that. I would imagine we'll see some of that melt away and people will go, all right, this is, this is not only a waste of time, but yeah, not great for the planet, not great for us. Um, you know, certainly not, uh, yeah, not a good use of resources and time. That's for sure. Yeah, that's totally what I'm um, also I'm totally behind that, what you're saying there. Um, and so this reset period is really, I think, a time for recalibrating. Uh, and I mentioned something about rethinking thinking, but I think mm-hmm. more personal than that, um, and this has to do with uh, people's relationship to the work they do, and maybe even a sense of purpose in their lives or a lack of purpose in their lives. So... Uh, it seemed that this reset is yes. a, also acts as an opportunity to um, get uh, some more clarity on what your particular contribution is, you know, what your particular offering is, what is your skill, your gift, your particular vision, whatever it is, so that when there, 
you know, when the virus does um, level out and it's not so much we're returning to normal, but there is going to be some return to community. Mm -hmm. And in that return, hopefully um, we can come back to the community with more vitality, uh, more clarity of vision, more clarity of purpose as to, well, you know, how are we fitting in? What do we have to offer? And I think this reset time is really a great time to, you know, experiment with that and to um, kind of reality check your own assumptions about who you think you are and what your talents and skill sets actually are as opposed to what you thought they were or believed they were. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, even I'm having to reconsider that even though I have an online business that, you know, you would imagine would be more minimally affected. It, it definitely is affected and I, I realized that I... Well, and I, I've been coasting a little bit for a while and thinking about refocusing things. And even though I may do something similar, um, I, I'm definitely realizing I need to either do more or hone, yeah, back in on what really, what I'm really useful for, you know, in in the world. What can I really offer that's that's unique and 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 you know worthy of uh, my taking up my space here? <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, it it definitely needs to change a little bit from. From where it's at, and I mean that, yeah. Some of it is just the the circumstance. Of course, uh, selling uh, bags, hemp bags, and travel travel gear, sports gear, whatever is obviously not going to work out in this situation. But in general, I think it it'll still help me refocus to something a little bit a little bit better, and maybe also have some backup, um, you know, usefulness. Some, some something else that I can that I can do in the community or whatnot that um, that goes beyond just simply what I'm doing to make money to, to earn a living and, and, uh, on a, on a bigger perspective. So, yeah. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts. Uh, you mentioned the internet and I'm really curious about your thoughts on the, um, rollout of 5g and how that, um, like there's some conspiracies moving around that, uh, there's a relationship between the coronavirus and 5g rollouts especially when you look at the, um, uh, the massive rollouts in China, um, uh, basically about six months before you know, the, the, the peak of the sickness that happened there, and then the massive rollouts in Italy, uh, mm. in Spain, um, hmm. al also in New York and Los Angeles and Seattle. These are all 5G hot points, and so there's, I don't know if you've, you know, uh, kind of run into that kind of conspiracy thing that's moving around. Um, I was wondering if you had, if you had any thoughts on that. You know, I I haven't much, I mean, I've, I've heard, I mean, of course, a million different conspiracy theories and to, as to all the things going on, uh, more than usual even, uh, but, uh, you know, be, with the 5G thing beyond when I think you had first brought it up and I talked to a few other people and it it seemed to me, I mean, I was, I was, I didn't dig into it too far, but it seemed to me like it's probably nothing of great concern from what I can understand of the technical aspects that it shouldn't be a problem. But hey, I mean, who knows? So that would, that would be a very interesting thing is what is the theory that, it, that it's breaking down people's immune systems or, or in, disrupting them in some way and making them vulnerable to this? Well, um, so I'm not an expert. I'm not an immunologist. But sure. the, um, there was about three or four uh, videos and other kinds of scientific papers that I've read uh, that have a kind of commonality and overlapping idea of what's going on with, mm. you know, the possibility of this interaction. And the one that uh, kind of stands out is this idea that the, mm. um, uh, the 5G acts on the human cell in a particular way that... Um, the word poisoning the human cell is what's been used in in these papers or these you know theories, mm -hmm. and then the immune system overreacts to at the cellular level getting poisoned, and in the in the overreaction of the immune system, it secretes the toxins out of itself, and now and those very toxins form what's called the coronavirus. So that this theory is basically oh. saying. It debunks the idea that the virus came from an animal or some market in China, but mm -hmm. it's actually it's actually produced by the immune system itself, uh, overreacting to um, uh, being poisoned by the um, uh, the radiation, uh, the radio waves of of massive five G. And of course, this <laughs> is going to 
is going to depend on the individual, the strength of, you know, the immune system. And, you know, you probably know something about the immune system, but sure. as you get older, especially in your 70s and 80s, the immune system deteriorates. It simply becomes weak. And this is one of the main right. reasons people die of natural causes, what they call natural causes, is that with a weak immune system, the body's, you know, a um, warehouse of uh, viruses and bacteria, just millions and billions of them reside in every single body. And it's the strength of the immune system that keeps things in check. And the, when the immune system becomes weak, you know, people get really sick and they die. Sure. So, um, so far, it looks like most of the people that have died from this so-called epidemic um, have been older, like, you know, mm -hmm. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, older. Mm -hmm. uh, there, of course, there have been younger people, too, have died. They're reporting them now and so forth. But uh, it doesn't look like the majority yet. Yeah. And and then there's some more, way more sinister conspiracy theories <laughs> going around, you know, about, sure. you know, some kind of Illuminati um, oh, um, yeah. panel Which... of individuals really looking to thin the herd <laughs> and uh, to establish a uh, worldwide government by implementing 5G across the globe um, and <laughs> basically, you know, keeping tabs on the population that, you know, uh, that will allow them to do that through the, um, you know, uh, the planetary nervous system, so to speak. Sure. I mean, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> I, I myself, I, I yeah. read them. Um, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a place of... Um, a kind of uh, suspension of belief. Um, it's mm -hmm. more like I'm just, you know, paying attention, considering this and that, but I haven't come to any conclusions like thinking, oh, this is really what's happening and we should watch out or something like that. I haven't gotten there yet. Well, that's good. I, I, I think you're usually wise enough to not get there the, until you have something more concrete. Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot going around, and it's interesting to enter, entertain these things and to think about them. I mean, I, I tend to, I tend to usually fall on the side of I think what you know Wilson Robert Anton Wilson would get to a lot where well okay yes there are conspiracies but rarely are they ever um, at the upper echelon levels together enough to really coordinate and keep things sort of a. Uh, you know, like a, the, the idea of a massive Illuminati really being able to coordinate a global effort and keep it together and keep it secret seems to be pretty, pretty far fetched when, you know, it, yeah, it's hard enough to just keep minimal things together. And, and then, of course, there's things like, you know, why destroying the economy doesn't seem to be good for anybody or I don't know. It's, it's interesting, but there's definitely I could see some speculation. I mean, you've got to wonder a little bit and. And certainly looking at the way that governments are reacting to this, and there and there's certainly some just very substantial fear as to what can governance now do, and if this, you know, whether or not this was engineered or a conspiracy or whatnot, one certainly could be in the future, and we can see how quickly rights and, and things can disappear and how the government can very quickly start overreaching um, in reaction to something. So whether they made up something or not, there's certainly a, a threat there, I think, to, to look out for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so tough to, um, I don't know, get a handle on what's actually might be happening, you know, with the broadcast sure. news pretty much yeah. run by corporations and advertising. They have their strict uh, parameters of what, you know, they want to have released and what they don't want to have released if they're going to keep a station, you know, in um, in the red or something like that. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, sometimes, uh, go out into more kind of a left field areas, uh, new sources that are way off the beaten path, not so much to like find something to believe in, but just try to get different points of view, different ways of seeing. And that's been an ongoing kind of personal, uh, quest of my own, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm always looking for, you know, um, new ways of seeing, and this uh, process fuels, it kind of motivates my own reason for making movies, which is to um, somehow present in my films, um, for those people who watch them, um, maybe some new ways of seeing things that maybe are familiar to start with, but if you look at them from a different angle, they appear to be uh, anything but familiar. There's some kind of um, uncommon or maybe mysterious component that's exposed if you can introduce 
you know, new ways of seeing. Mm, yes, yes. Well, you've always been been good at that, and I, uh, yeah, I, I find myself enjoying your works uh, more and more the older I get. For some reason, especially uh, lately, I think I've been on a little bit of a kick of not. I, I don't know. I, I've seen just about. Just I, I don't know. I'm getting a little bit bored, I guess, with the with the usual. And I, I kind of for a long time I shunned the usual, so it was fun to kind of dig back into uh, more. Mm, I don't know a, a different different mode of thinking that might be considered more normal or or more uh, mm, straightforward and 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 self conscious I suppose or whatnot in in films and art and things which I, which I explored through but it was fun to to go back and and you know to watch your latest film and then I started playing around with some of the a little bit more on the uh, introspective uh, uh, I wouldn't say quite surrealist but sort of in that in that mode where you're kind of having an experience watching the film rather than um, it trying to throw a message at you or provoke something in particular out of you. Um, it's, uh, it's been interesting. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's just one of my um, uh, kind of guidelines in making a film is, is to provide an experience for the viewer, you know, as, as opposed to, um, you know, presenting some kind of um, ideal for living or some kind of role model, you know, to um, identify with. In fact, you know, I've made a point in all my films. I mean, this has been one of the, I guess, one of the consistent things of of my movies for the last um, 25 years is that um, uh, I don't develop characters for my stories that can ever be role models. You know, they, they kind of inhibit... <laughs> that reflex uh, for the viewer to admire or to uh, worship or to exalt, you know, I find it far more um, uh, interesting, but also instructive, informative, that's the word I wanted to use, mm. um, to um, show, show individuals more in their uh, shortcomings, their flaws, um, you know, the brokenness of, of people not as any kind of um, message of healing, oh, we must heal our broken selves, but there's sometimes a certain kind of um, intelligence or maybe a kind of wisdom that can arrive from uh, brokenness if it's not pathologized, you know, if it's, mm. not, if it's not made to be this, like, pitiful thing or if it's not meant yeah. to evoke sympathy. Maybe there's another way of inhabiting the brokenness or inhabiting the shortcoming or the flaw that can bring about this thing that I call um, new ways of seeing. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, somehow you've managed to do that with your characters without, uh, without it being... Um... I don't know, at least for me, bothersome in a way that... Because I've noticed a trend, especially in the last, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years, where there's rarely a character that you can look up to in any movie or, or a good example, but but it's done in such a way that it's not... I don't think you learn anything out of it. It's not pleasing. It's just these characters that you just go, wow, that, that person's horrible. And that, you know, and they don't, they don't, they just seem like little brats, you know, or something like it. They keep gearing it towards a younger and younger generation. And then it just seems like these flawed characters, but they're really proud of their flaws. And they're really like, you know, happy about having a chip on their shoulder and hating and blaming the world for everything. And that's just, that's just okay. And, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of scenarios, but I've just noticed there's this trend in writing, and there's something that I find very aggravating about that. My wife's the same way. We'll start watching a show, and we'll just go, I don't like any of these characters. I wouldn't want to be friends with any of them. There, <laughs> there's nobody here to that's even you know interesting, and so it, it's that can be very frustrating. But somehow you you do it in a manner where, and like I, I think yeah, I mean you know, it's almost like you learn something through the flaws, and it it makes them human. And, and you can identify. Well, I may not really identify, but it's it's interesting. That's really the best way I can say yeah. it. It's just very interesting, and it does it does something, and it and it's compelling. And I well, and I like that. Mm -hmm. In in um, kind of traditional or classic screenwriting process, where you're creating characters, you're supposed to um, follow this kind of rule of making a character that's easily identifiable. I can identify with it. You can be mm -hmm. that person. Sure. And so I've I've uh, rebelled against that tendency 
um, mostly because I've come to experience this process of identification as its own kind of hypnosis. Mm. And so I thought it would be more interesting to break the trance, to break that spell of uh, the compulsion to identify and start moving more into um, dialogue and characters and situations that are relatable, but not, you don't, you're not required to identify with anyone. And mm. so it's also, um, uh, it can be troublesome in its own way because um, it's why, I think it's one of the reasons why my films aren't for everybody because they're, sure. you know, they don't, they don't follow mainstream or commercial standards and values at all. They're their own kind of animal, their own kind of, almost like each one cuts its own genre. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, the film I just finished, uh, The Vanishing Field, mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen any other movie cover this story before. This is, mm -hmm. you know, life in a monastery uh, with this Zen monk that's using his meditation practice to keep weaving his body and <laughs> becoming traumatized by it, but he keeps going back to it over and over thinking that he's going to achieve some kind of either enlightenment or escape or something or rather, I'm not going to like, you know, um, <laughs> you know, spoil the, the, the surprise whole, for people yeah. who want to see it because anybody sure. can see it right now. In fact, you know, it's on uh, YouTube as a free view, uh, the vanishing field. I can probably put that in the search engine there and it yes. probably will come up. Yes. But yeah, that's my newest feature. Um, it was it was supposed to have its world premiere up in Portland, but then with the epidemic of fear, I mean virus, I mean fear. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was canceled. And so I thought, okay, the next best thing, well, I'll just release it on YouTube as a free, free view. And then what I've also done um, is I've decided to um, uh, provide a web page with links to all my movies that are now, now available as as free views online and uh, you know anyone can find that page if you go to verticalpool.com and there's a link there that says films by Antero and that should you know bring you right to the page and mm -hmm. uh, there's probably going to be more movies there than you want to know about <laughs> yeah and I, and I would recommend to people too if one if you start one and it's not your cup of tea try another because there's you definitely yeah, you, they're all they're all pretty different. I mean, they all, there's a there's a feeling or a flavor that that runs throughout them. But it, but yeah, they're very different subjects and, and styles in a lot of ways. And it's uh it's interesting. Yeah, and that latest one, the vanishing uh, field. Uh, sorry, it's vanishing field, right? Did you say Van the vanishing field? Field. Yes, I just want to make sure I had that right. Uh, and uh, yeah, we I watched that. I you know with uh, my daughter Kira, who is six years old, and she sat through the whole thing, which surprised the heck out of me because. Even though she used to be a little more open to whatever I would show her, as she's gotten older, the attention span has waned a, a little bit, and and usually something's got to be pretty funny or pretty loud, or or there's got to be something really compelling to keep her keep her into it. Uh, but she she sat through the whole thing, and then she was making jokes about out of body experiences for at least a good week or two after that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was cute. Even sometimes it wasn't even a joke. She's like, oh, I was having an out of body experience. I'm going, I kind of believe you actually. So she's probably still halfway there. But uh, but yeah, it was uh, I, I enjoyed that one. It was kind of and again, it was kind of a kind of an experience. You know, I, I sat down and had a drink and just kind of sat there and 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 just uh just enjoyed it and it and it made me want to go through and watch yeah more films like that we're going you know what i just want to watch uh like what was it so oh, strawberry something and i'm trying to remember the filmmaker it's uh something, Bergman. yeah i believe so yeah and it was i i can't remember what the it's strawberry something but there was a film like that and a few others that i know were kind of in the in the vein even some stuff like wings of desire which wasn't isn't totally like that but it's kind of in that realm where you're sort of drifting through a world and and experiences and characters and it's it's not your usual antagonist protagonist sort of hero stories which i enjoy those as well but uh but it's more of a meditative sort of uh i don't know experience and uh, yeah i've been really i've been enjoying that and you're watching your film kind of reminded me that i uh i really do dig that sometimes so it was it was a good uh it was a good thing <laughs> 
Yeah, each, I think uh, a film, um, one, my favorite filmmaker, um, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, the Russian filmmaker, mm. um, he, um, uh, he's no longer alive and he only made like, I think a half a dozen features. But uh, I would recommend them, if you haven't seen any of them, to look them up because I kind of, uh, from what you're talking about, the kind of films that you want to go back to see, sort of sounds like what he's really good at. And I should say he's actually the best at that kind of thing of anything I've seen. But, mm. um, yeah, you also talked about each of my films being kind of different and yet with this kind of, you know, s similar kind of feel or vein through them all. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the ways that, I mean, one of the things that motivates to me to make a film, any film, I have to go someplace I haven't gone before, and I have to somehow um, find a way to advance my craft or advance some element of the filmmaking process that I have not advanced before. And so with the current one, um, I wanted to work with all non-actors, and there was no real script here. Um, in fact, uh, hmm. most of the action took place at the Great Vow Zen Monastery where I stayed for a few days and a few nights. And the main characters were actually um, um, uh, Zen, uh, Buddhist Zen monks that live <laughs> in the monastery. I was wondering. And, <laughs> and they, they agreed um, to play along with this idea of a movie. Uh, with me. And I told them they didn't have to memorize lines, but that I would give them, you know, little prompts here and there, maybe an idea or a phrase or something. And then I would let the camera roll and find out, you know, they would find out what their truth was in the moment uh, in the interaction. So hmm. pretty much it's all improvised um, by non-actors, but because the residents of the Zen monastery, they're immersed in the place and the whole climate there. And it's really organic to their whole um, being and their whole expression. So that there's an authenticity that just comes across, I think, that these guys are really, you know, living there. They are these kinds of monk-like guys because they are. <laughs> 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 and, and then, um, but... Um, I, I, was, I wasn't really making a documentary, um, uh, even though uh, I was using uh, uh, the Zen monastery as a setting and Zen monks in mm -hmm. a story that occurred in a monastery amongst Zen monks. The primary uh, crux of the whole thing was more inspired by an early experience that I had when I was 23 years old. Uh, when I was traumatized by a full-blown out-of-by experience uh, mm. myself, uh, a spontaneous one that uh, occurred, you know, after uh, a very uh, intense rehearsal night. This was back when I was writing and directing plays in Berkeley back in the 70s. Mm. And uh, I just like was laying in, in bed there with my girlfriend at the time and closing my eyes and all of a sudden there was all these internal shifts and changes of energy that was occurring. And before I knew it, I was popping out of my physical body, floating around the room, looking back at myself and my girlfriend at the time and thinking right there out of body. Oh, I'm not as good looking as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I won't, I won't go into the, any more details of what happened in the out-of-body experience, but it was such a, a jolt, a, such a shock to my sense of identity that, um, you know, coming back into my body, it was impossible for me to fully identify with my physical body because I had so fully inhabited hmm. another body uh, that yeah. then was able to look back up my physical body and it's that shock that has continued impacting my life and inspiring all my films um, to this day, all of which uh, convey various uh, dream sequences, various out-of-body events, various excursions into some weird psychic dimension or whatever. I can't stop doing that because this is part of my everyday perception. And so 
And that's where it all began, like 23 years ago. And so it's this film, The Vanishing Field, um, that's maybe my most, one of my most personal ones because of, um, you know, where it all came from. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that, it, that I decided to set the story in a Zen monastery is almost arbitrary because I could have set it mm. almost any, anywhere. But it seems to work that this guy is meditating really hard, wanting to get out of his body, and, and, and he figures out how to do it. But it just has really uh, unexpected consequences, which I won't go into um, sure. because it'll, it'll kind of spoil the surprise. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you had that first experience, was that was that a relatively sober experience? Sober? That's funny. No, um, it okay. was it was an extreme experience. Mm -hmm. um, it was an extreme experience, and uh, while I, I was very conscious while it was happening. And I wanted very badly to be able to prove that it wasn't just a dream I was having of having an out-of-body experience. Mm. I wanted to find some way to actually um, validate that, yeah, this was actually a genuine out-of-body experience. And I didn't know how I was going to do that, except, and this is, I'm going into the actual experience here a little bit. Mm. Um, I decided to kind of float out of the bedroom where I was staying, and I was just standing in the living room of the place where I was renting at the time with another couple. And just kind of hanging out there in an empty room, and then the couple enters from outdoors. They'd been out for the night, and they were coming in, they were laughing and giggling, and they were walking towards their bedroom. But before they walked towards their bedroom, the woman uh, grabbed um, an apple from the basket of fruit on the uh, uh, table in the kitchen and took a big old bite out of the apple and just stuck the apple down on the table by itself. And then they continued off into the bedroom to do what couples do in bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I saw that apple. I go, shit, is this like some kind of weird symbol, like an apple? What the fuck? <laughs> and, and then, you know, shortly after that, I decided I needed to get back into my body because the actual experience uh, was becoming more terrifying. You know, there were, you know, weird um, entities that were starting to probe me. There were weird sounds and images coming, you know, around and, and it started becoming this threatening mm. um, experience. So I decided to start wiggling my toes for some reason. Okay, just wiggle my toes. And I don't know if that was like some kind of unconscious image from the Wizard of Oz, you know, with the clicking the red heels or whatever, you know, with the <laughs> red shoes, you know, clicking the red shoes so they can come back. So anyway, I was wiggling my toes and I got back into my body and I was just kind of lying there just thinking, oh my God, what happened? What was, what's, what's going on? And then I remembered the apple. So I got up. I walked out of the room, and there's the fucking apple with a big bite out of it. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. I was, just, I was fucking terrified. But the yeah. thing is, what happened to me the next day, after I kind of got through all the fears and you know emotions or whatever, I wanted to do it again. You know, I was so scared. I thought, oh, this is really fucked up, but I want to do it again. I want to get out again. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I kind of exhausted myself thinking, well, maybe that was part of, you know, getting out of my body. And then I, um, I laid down uh, and I started hearing the sounds of jets taking off, which was one of the, the symptoms of the first out of body experience. So the audio soundtrack was a sound of a jet taking off. I said, oh, <laughs> shit, here it comes again. It's going to happen again. And I was just like so ready to launch into it. And the jet just kind of trailed off and nothing happened. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so it was like, okay, all right. This is not something I can force, obviously. Mm. Uh, this is something that kind of happened on its own. You know, the timing was right, the chemistry or whatever, you know, and I just, you know, stopped trying to do it after that. But the weird thing is, is that it con has continued to impact me um, in so many ways, uh, mm. ways of seeing, ways of thinking, um, you know, the beliefs and assumptions that I've developed and formed and dropped off and outgrown and molted or whatever. Um, but more than anything, it's um, influenced anything creative, uh, poetic, musical, theatrical, and cinematic that's come through me, um, you know, since then. And that's like 40-something years ago. 
So it's yeah. it's been a real thing, uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, and something I can't deny. And at the, at, the, at the same time, it's not something I have ever wanted to pursue. I've never wanted to get into this place. Well, let's do it again. And mm-hmm. it was almost as if once was enough. <laughs> got, got the message and hung up the phone. Yeah, that's probably I did. it was it was just like that. You know, sometimes once is enough. Mm hmm. So that so this wasn't let me rephrase the, the question. But was this chemically induced or or I mean, as wasn't far as high, yeah, wasn't high on any drugs. I mean, I was taking LSD yeah. around that era. But sure. um, I, I just had come from, you know, a heavy three or four hour rehearsal for one of my plays. And uh, you don't rehearse theater on LSD. <laughs> good point. Good point. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work too well. <laughs> Unless it's like a total LSD story or whatever. Sure. <laughs> it's the sixties. I gotta ask. It could have been. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but it was. Yeah, I was just thoroughly spent, thoroughly exhausted. Um, as those rehearsals can, you know, can leave you pretty exhausted. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's the only thing I can attribute it to was just. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure there's uh, uh, the long-term influence of psychedelics, uh, which I had been taking for the previous, on and off for the previous seven years, maybe. You know, I was, you know, uh, uh, kind of a weekend acid head for, you know, good, you know, six, seven, eight years. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that, you know, obviously conditioned my nervous system and brought me into um, certain sensitivities, uh, mm-hmm. certain ways of seeing things, certain ways of reacting to things that um, pretty much will set apart my nervous system from people who have never taken LSD. You know, their nervous systems are right. going to have a different, you know, kind of, you know, positioning around all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that... I was, yeah, I was, I was sober uh, and exhausted, and I don't know how the fuck it happened. <laughs> that, that's even more interesting yeah if you're on uh, in some ways that's well probably good to more validate the experience in some manner because if you have that kind of experience but you're on acid it's very hard to verify how much of it was you know you imagining things and, and chemically induced and how much you know was truly some sort of authentic experience <laughs> but uh, and they cross over of course but uh but yeah that's that's an interesting one is uh is Oregon still trying to uh I, I believe still trying to pass the law to uh, legalize uh, uh mushrooms I from what last oh, yeah. time I checked that's yeah, interesting it, it, yeah it's definitely on that track and I think there may have actually been um I haven't followed it so you know people have to do their own research but uh, I think it's pretty close to you know doing it across the board I don't think it's quite mm-hmm. there yet but it's on it's on the way. Well, they should just get that done, especially for the quarantine time. I mean, we got a lot of time on our hands. People need some something to do. <laughs> well, you know, people will get it regardless anyway. It's you know, true. Where yes, there's absolutely. a will, there's a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that that would be very interesting to see what would happen uh, if that if that gets around more and we see more people diving in again. But uh, there's definitely been a, a bit of a resurgence in in at least in people being open to it. I've uh, there's uh, Michael Pollan, you know, he did his latest book about psychedelics, and it's it's interesting to see, but it, he was talking a lot of it from more of a medical and therapeutic um, standpoint. Much of the book was focused on that, and so it's gaining a lot of uh, a lot of ground there, although I haven't really, I actually suspect the usage of it is, is not as, not really high, but the acceptability of it seems to have gone up. So uh, it's uh, interesting. We'll see what uh, what becomes of all of that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the reason why um, I stopped taking um, psychoactives uh, is right around the age of, um, hmm, when was that, 24, actually just shortly after the out-of-body experience, mm. um, that I had it, at that time been, um, this was in 1977, um, initiated into a... Um, creative um, physical theater process, very ritualistic, that then um, I developed out of that because a particular group that started it was a small group, um, and they only stayed together for about a year, and out of that I developed my own method um, of uh, paratheater um, that I developed 
uh, with groups for the next 40 years. So I stayed with this process of paratheatrical research. And I'm bringing this up now because one of the reasons why I never went back to taking psychedelics was that part of the uh, experience and changes in my consciousness and my awareness and my felt sense uh, doing this paratheatrical work um, was very close to psilocybin. Um, mm. very close to the, uh, that sense of fluidity and indivisibility, the oneness with all things, but a kind of mm. moving into a hyper fluid ego state, um, and really being high out of that, a sense of ecstatic, um, rapturous, um, emotion and feeling, uh, would be a fairly consistent, um, return on my investment and my commitment in this work and it continued doing that it never stopped over the over the next 40 years i never got bored with it it just kept happening and so my nervous system um has been also altered and conditioned and is probably what i need to say transformed by long-term um paratheater processes um and so that's also part of i have to admit part of um mm. you know you know why how i got this way who i am and you know why it is that i create what i do um or how i do it it comes through me and this is how this is what it looks like for people who don't know the paratheatrical process and 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 are probably sitting there going what the heck is he talking about i don't think i remember getting into psychedelic states preparing to do a you know a production of les mes or something uh can you explain a little <laughs> bit of uh what the what the process is or what what paratheater is all about i will um so last september i actually ended a 42 year era of doing paratheatrical work. I don't do it with groups anymore. Um, people can find out uh, quite a bit about it by going to paratheatrical.com. And I guess in a nutshell, uh, paratheater uh, is a word to um, uh, address a, um, uh, uh, a somatic, meaning of the body, um, and highly visceral um, medium of physical theater that is sometimes non-performance oriented, sometimes it's performing in front of an audience that combines uh, methods of dance, of theater, of uh, zazen meditation for accessing the internal landscape of autonomous forces in the body as movement resources. So in a sense we're we're hijacking the body's own energies, the body's own, you know, sources of power, sources of tension, sources of emotion, and giving expression physically, gesture-wise, sound-wise, uh, spontaneous and sometimes convulsive uh, expression of, um, you know, uh, forces uh, innate to the, you know, into to the human body. Uh, it's not a um well it's, it's a kind of discipline a uh, physical discipline like like a dance form or a theater form but it's also um not for everybody uh because mm -hmm. it it it, uh, it it requires uh you have to be physically fit to even do it and you have to be also physically strong and have um a pretty healthy social and emotional life already because the nature of the work, even though it's in a group, it's not social. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, we, we work in an asocial climate uh, that begins with realizing our non-responsibility to other people in the room and redirecting um, that sense of responsibility, that sense of our own attention, um, redirecting it basically to the sources of energy in our own bodies um, towards their uh, expression and interaction with others in the room. But again, it's not a social interaction. It, it, it opens up to a whole different way of being in a room with people uh, that has nothing to do with, you know, the social conventions of like getting approval or checking in or 
courtship or, you know, am I, you know, attractive to that person or, you know, that kind, these kinds of social mm -hmm. impulses that we all go through, you know, and when we enter in groups of people, we're all checking each other out and there's different social protocols or whatever. So in the, um, uh, the paratheater group work, all of that is minimized and even in many ways um, uh, almost eliminated. And, and what that does is it creates a kind of climate, a kind of asocial climate where a certain level of self-work and uh, self-expression can occur. Hmm. That's interesting. And I, and I, that's a, that's a good, I know it's a tough thing to sum up or explain to people. So I think you did a pretty good job there. And we did, what was the name of the, there was a documentary ish kind of picture that you did that, that went through a lot of the process. Um, and I'm trying to remember what the name of that one was. Well, there's, there was quite a few. I think um, the one you helped edit, there's several you helped edit. One of them right. was um, Dream Body, Earth Body. And uh, the other one was uh, Orphans of Delirium. Right. Okay. And then there was something called Crux. I think yeah. you saw that early on with, uh, you know, Duncan Cook. And <laughs> yes. I think it really creeped creeped you out <laughs> yeah it was kind of funny because i didn't i you know yeah i didn't I, he, he brought me to this film going oh you're gonna love this guy he's you know he was friends with robert anton wilson who he knew i loved and i oh you're gonna you know, enjoy this and and i remember i saw the movie and went eh, eh, i don't know not quite my thing like there were there were pieces that were interesting but i thought ah, this is a strange thing it just doesn't yeah and sometimes the parrot theater has not settled with me well but i but i get it but i don't it's not something I necessarily always enjoy enjoy watching, and I it, so it it took some time for it to uh, to really settle in a little bit. And uh, but I did find, but it was funny because then we still ended up we did end up working together, and I very much enjoyed working on the first film, uh, uh, Tragos, with you, which I I really I I'm I'm kind of itching to sit down and watch that one again. I have been for a while. So is, is that one is that one streaming online? By the way. Oh yeah, yeah, they're all online. Oh um, good. You know, verticalpool.com, you find it. And I don't know if the, your listeners un, uh, know this already, but, you know, you were my editor of um, my films pretty much from the year 2000 through 2015. Yeah, that was a, a long run, and it, it really it kind of broke my heart a little bit, not not being able to be involved on the last one. I mean, part of, me, part of me is happy to be free from editing because it just started to not be a fun process, but I always enjoyed working with you, and I on this last film when you you had messaged me and said hey can you can you still work on this and i just it yeah it broke me a little bit knowing that ever since they killed uh basically this piece of software that i that i knew like the back of my hand and uh ever since they killed that off the old final cut pro doesn't run anymore and i I've, I've tried working with the new one and it just it drives me bonkers so i i uh i had to throw in the towel and uh but you you did a remarkably good job uh doing that on your own there so i, I, I know thanks and on iMovie too imagine that <laughs> yeah it was very very good so i i was expecting to send you i watched it and i thought oh i'm gonna have to send him a bunch of technical notes and i i hope he hope he managed but <laughs> he did really good i think i had one or two things to say and overall it was it was it was really really uh well done so uh yeah yeah congratulations that was good stuff well i know i appreciate it and i took your notes to heart and uh fixed those um uh points those specific points that you made and now the uh the new corrected version is online oh very nice yeah i i, I do miss that work a little bit I, there's still i still feel like some days there's there's a film in me somewhere that wants to get out and who knows? Could could happen still. So we'll see what uh, what goes on. But uh, I'm I, I'm glad to be able to enjoy uh, other people's works, uh, especially yours. I, it's nice to see uh, see you getting back to film because I know you were you were about to stop. You kind of you kind of took a break there where you, you were kind of done making movies. And then what, yeah. what made you come back? Oh, good question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 2015. I made um, a film called Out of the Woods. And I just felt uh, kind of spent after that. And in some ways, um, kind of sick of filmmaking. I was thinking, oh, I've, I've made like too many. I got to get out of here. And mm. so I, I just decided, okay, no more films. I'm done. I'm done. And that kind of cleared the decks um, for my move to Portland, Oregon, where um, uh, I had the opportunity over a couple of years to stage five separate 
paratheatrical productions that were very fulfilling for me. It brought me into a whole different kind of creative space uh, that wasn't mediated, that was alive, you know, that was unpredictable mm. and organic and, and got to work with people in, in a whole different way. And, and, uh, and then that kind of ran its course. And last September, like I mentioned earlier, I just quit completely that. And in the space of uh, quitting, um, the muses of cinema basically came knocking <laughs> at my door and saying, hey, you know, here's, uh, here's something you might want to look into. And, um, and that's the other thing about having worked in this paratheatrical process for so long. Um, it has created in me a certain um, receptivity to um, autonomous forces, meaning archetypes even. And so when I say the muses, I'm actually quite serious about that, that there is this kind of archetypal presence that I refer to as the muse. And the muse, a lot of people think my wife Sylvie is my muse, but it's not true. I, I would never, you know. Put that <laughs> burden put, on her? <laughs> no, I never would put that on her. In fact, at the beginning of our relationship, like 100 years ago, <laughs> uh, I tried to do that. And she, she totally... She totally did, was not into it. And, and so that kind of pushed me back to, you know, another relationship to the muses that don't involve uh, an actual person, but some <laughs> other more mythological uh, mm -hmm. orientation, uh, sometimes referred to as the daemon, uh, not the demon, but the daemon spelled D-A-E-M-O-N, you know, mm -hmm. Google it. There's a mythology attached to it. That very much is uh, in sync with what I call the um, archetype of the muses. So yeah, the mm -hmm. muses of cinema called me, uh, gave me um, an offer I couldn't refuse, and um, uh, it basically pointed me in a direction I had never gone in before. Um, I didn't know if it was going to be possible, which is always one of the reasons I do anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and in doing so, I... I've earned a little more confidence in a certain area. And so that's always good. And this is, you know, filmmaking, I think, at its best for an individual is a confidence building process. If you're constantly making with each film, going in directions that you hadn't gone in before, doing things you didn't think you could do, and you end up doing it, you will build genuine confidence. It's not just bravado or arrogance, but you just start getting better at uh, taking risks and mm. uh, sol and solving problems, which, uh, you know, half of the filmmaking process is just that. It's taking risks and problem solving. Mm, sure. Absolutely. So what is it that, Kira, what has motivated you um, through your life? Because, I mean, you're not the, you know, more uh, militaristic disciplinary type that just, you know, forces himself to get up at 4 a.m. and start to kick ass kind of thing. I mean, it, you... You, you seem to operate on, on a different level, and yet you are very productive. I mean, you, you get a lot done. You've written books. You've done a lot of plays. You've uh, put out a number of films, and, and, and it goes on and on. Um, what, yeah, what, what, how, do you, how do you get into that creative, but, you know, a motivated process to sit down and do these things? Well, something happened um, long ago, and this is actually before the outer body experience, although that kind of amplified what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. And I think it was around maybe my 17 or 18 year, like uh, late teens. Um, I had this uh, kind of revelation that um, my time was worth more to me than my money, than money. Mm. And that as a teenager, I... Um, I wanted to only own my own time. I wanted to do whatever I could to own my own time. And if that meant just kind of hustling and making ends meet and, you know, eating top ramen and going into food stamps or whatever it was, it didn't matter. It was about making an art out of poverty for me. Mm. And which is something I did all throughout my 20s. I didn't really start making any kind of money until well into my 30s, mid, mid to late 30s. However, what I had done I had accomplished um, something uh, central to, you know, life as I know it, and that is I've always owned my own time. So I've had a lot of time on my hands. 
And anybody that's got a lot of time on their hands, um, if they're a thinking type like I am, um, pretty soon you have to start thinking about what makes your life worth living, without which <laughs> your life would not be worth living. And so I've gotten pretty clear on what makes my worth my my life worth living. You know, my mm. sense of um, values is pretty uh, solid. It's pretty unshakable. And so I just you know tend to what makes my life worth living. And you know, in 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 the most simplistic ways, it's it's basically about serving creation and mm. staying creative staying in alignment with the creative processes i know it and as it's developing and growing and staying creative is not the same thing as being artistic you know the the experience of creativity is much larger um it's like a much larger category that art is then a subcategory of the creative but i've also learned that not all art is creative. Uh, most of the art mm. I've seen, whether it's on screen or music or on the stage or whatever, is dead art. Yes. It's not alive. And so to me, if art is going to be alive, it has to emerge from a creative place. It has to somehow come out of uh, a creative resource. It can't be formulaic, in other words. And so, you know, this has been what's kept me motivated. These are the things that excite me. These are the things that get me up in the morning. And um, uh, I never rush. That's another thing. I don't rush, mm. period. I always take my time in everything I do. Mm. Um, and this, you know, this if I'm around people who are rushing, I can be terribly annoying because I don't go along with them. I just, I'm <laughs> taking my time here. <laughs> yes, I recall. And, and, and part of what, what not rushing brings about is, a, is an experience of time itself that is more sensual and in some ways um, feels, uh, how can I put it, um, it's, it feels more conducive to my feeling nature. You know, it's almost like the faster I move, the less I feel. Yes. And I need to feel, I need to keep feeling um, and that begins my own creative process is staying close to, you know, the feeling nature. So I don't get too locked up into my head, too much thinking, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to end up living in a mental house where, you know, I'm looking at everything as if from behind a plate glass window and I'm not having an experience. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I think, I, I think... I, I certainly suffer from that problem often. My the brain gets a little too uh, overly amped up, and I and I've noticed that I can always tell when I stop appreciating all the great things around me, or when I'm drinking something simple like drinking a cup of tea, and I go, "Wow, I I finished that," and and not for one moment did I remember how amazing it tasted or or how pleasurable it was just to be sitting there drinking a cup of tea, which is something that when I'm in the right frame of mind I very much appreciate and I will very much enjoy and um, and even just yeah watching it was funny because watching your film and then going into those other films that I was talking about it 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 kind of helped get me back into that okay let's slow down let's have an experience let's appreciate <laughs> this let's let's feel this you know let's not just you know get go through it and uh, and I it, it, it's a feeling that I've, I've been able to sometimes you know, um, cultivate in my life a little bit better, but it, it comes and goes. And so I, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, you, you're, you're very good at that. And, um, and, and that's, uh, I, I like that. And actually, and, and to put it, of course, I, I'm obsessed with golf lately. And I will say that when, when you play golf again, it, it mirrors life so well, when you, if you play rushed and, and you're like that, not only will you not enjoy it, but you probably will not play very well. <laughs> Whereas if you slow down and relax and take your time often, well, you'll play better. So you'll actually probably play faster when you will get done looking at how long your match, your round took, but, uh, but you'll, uh, you'll have enjoyed it more. And, um, yeah, there's just, there's something about that that slowing down that actually seems to it just makes everything just makes everything a little bit better and it's it's beyond a slowing down it's 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 just fe really feeling the experience and being there being present um and and being open to that yeah it's a 
it's an interesting thing, and I, I, I lose it often, so I'm very thankful when I find things, and it, whether it be art or of any kind, uh, whatnot, that, that helped take me there. I even found myself recently, uh, I must have been in the same m- mode, of, uh, mode of thinking, but I suddenly had turned on some what I would consider modern jazz, which is anything past 1950 or so. <laughs> I've always liked older jazz, but uh, like Django Reinhardt and things, but the modern stuff, I never quite understood it and i went oh that's interesting and i'm sure they're great musicians but i couldn't i just couldn't dig it and i threw on some modern jazz the other day because i just happened to have some that i've kept around and i actually liked it and i went oh i just kind of sat back i sat on the couch and i i just sat there for an hour and just listened to music and i kind of dug it and i i couldn't remember the last time i just sat down and listened to music and enjoyed it like that so uh yeah i'm I'm pretty i'm pretty sure that um uh golf um your, your playing golf has something to do with your new appreciation of jazz. Uh, <laughs> go, go, I don't play golf, but it seems like such a, like a mystical uh, sport. And, you know, cause I, I know what, what it, what it means to, you know, to slow down. So you're, it's almost like the, the aperture of your perception opens up. You get to perceive more reality and you get to perceive more of the gradation of the stroke that you're using and which particular angle you're going to hit the ball at. And things open up where you can see more mm-hmm. as well as as well as feel more. And there's yes. something about modern jazz um you know, that it, there's a flight to it, you know, that there's mm-hmm. a movement to it. it. It's not stultified, you know, it, it, yeah. and there's this fluidity. Yes. And so you, you've become perhaps more fluid and so that you can appreciate that spirit when you hear it. Yes, that is that is probably a, a good way of looking at it and describing it. Yeah, I think I think that really is it. And it's been, it's been a, yeah, it's been a real... A real pleasure, and it's, it is. And there's definitely in golf. There's certainly a, for myself at least, and I, I think for there's a. It's kind of a small subset of us weird golf rebels, but <laughs> but and I think really actually at the core of the sport, I think it was more like this a long time ago. But it it evolved out of it into more of a a typical sport where people get a little too carried away with, you know, technique and scores and overthinking everything. But I, there's something in the spirit of golf originally that's it is very it's very meditative. I mean, really, you're you're sitting around playing a sport in a Zen garden to start with. I mean, it's a, it's a manicured nature of sorts. And, uh, and yeah, and there's, there is something mystical and, and near magical about it. Cause you, you, you just can't break it all down. It's impossible. No matter how hard you try, you'll drive yourself crazy. And, uh, and there's, uh, even actually the, the group of people that I play with often, uh, it, they're all fans of this book, which was written by, um, Michael, uh, I'm blanking on his last name. So always happens to me in podcasts. But anyway, he's the guy who also co-founded the uh, the Assailant Institute or uh, in Big Sur. Esalon, Esalon, Michael Murphy. Yes, Michael Murphy. So he wrote a book uh, called Golfing in the Kingdom, and it's about a well. It's really it's it's half. He he won't explain how much of it is fiction and how much is was really going on but it was really about more or less him going he was on his way to an ashram in in india and he stops off to play some golf in scotland and meets this very golf guru type character that you know and they get into philosophy and life and golf and how it relates and all these different things and it it's a real it's a fascinating book and uh, but now but there's a whole society of golfers that i that i spend time with um that are big fans of this book and uh and we go around and golf and it's it's uh it's it's really it's quite a lot of fun so it's a very it, yeah it's a very meditative um and and spiritual experience that uh that we try to help promote uh through that but i mean i i think when it's played well um that's really that's really what it comes down to so it's it's, it's been very interesting <laughs> i'm glad you found it i'm glad golf found you yeah, me too. Now I just have to figure out how to make uh, some money on it so I can, <laughs> so I can continue to uh, continue to have the time to play because it it is time consuming and I'm I'm terribly obsessed. So uh, I I have to uh, find a way to give back to the to that community or or something or something other that will uh, help out. But hey, you know, luckily no one's making uh, anything with hemp in in the golf gear category. So that's kind of a wide open field for me if I want to try to take my current skills um and and throw it into the golf world and see if that works so uh so yeah we'll see i may i may go there next but uh yeah i've been having a hard time focusing on uh on my regular 
company uh, duties. I don't know. I think it, it lost a little bit of uh, I lost a little bit of the love when I got too bogged down in dealing with manufacturing and all these things. And now this whole quarantine's come around and nobody's you know buying anything, which makes sense. It, but it also frustrates me because I'm dealing with international supply chains, and it would be nice to not have to do that to keep things more oh. more local and and more. I don't know, it, more tangible somehow, but uh, yeah, it's part of what I'm I'm going through in this little this little period here, figuring out yeah. what else uh, can be done. You know, all, all we can do is kind of wait and see. You know that there's, um, you know, it's it's not like the uh, the virus is on our watch; we're on its watch. You know. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting time. I, 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 I remain fairly positive in that I, I don't see it turning into a, a Mad Max dystopian world. And th- then again, I don't watch the news really. So it's probably <laughs> isolating me. And I live in a small community where things have hardly changed and everybody's uh, quite friendly. And uh, yeah, we're all, nobody's going to restaurants and we're keeping distance. But other than that, everybody's in a, a pretty good mood. And I think uh, doing our best to just get along and that is something positive i think it'll come out of it people will really value community yeah. greatly after this well, so sometimes i find the most accurate news just looking out the window <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely got to do that sometimes <laughs> well hey um i is there anything else in particular that you wanted to talk about or mention or ways that people can find you cuz i'll I think I'll save uh, any more of our conversation for a, a future episode. Yeah, no, this is uh, a good place to um, kind of wrap it up. Uh, I have two websites I mentioned earlier on. I'll mention them again, paratheatrical.com. Um, and then for my films, music, and um, uh, other kinds of like books and things like that, that's verticalpool.com. Um, but that's it. You know, I've, I've pretty much said all I've got to say here. <laughs> okay. Well, there'll definitely, definitely be more. I know we could, we could go on. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have you back on again and thank you so much for, uh, for your time. Uh, hope you stay, uh, uh, healthy and, and safe out there and, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you. We'll talk to you the next time. <laughs> okay. S- stay creative. <laughs> I like it. Thank you. <laughs>you enjoyed this episode of radio dell if you want to find out more about the show or myself or our sponsoring company you can head on over to chrisodell.com that's c-h-r-i-s-o-d-e-l-l.com and uh, just a little word about our sponsoring company since it uh, allows me the time and then the freedom uh, to be able to do this this podcast uh, that is a uh, company that I started back in 2007. It is a hemp gear company, and what does that mean? Basically, we have bags and clothing and all sorts of other uh, different accessories and fun things made with primarily uh, hemp textiles, which are antimicrobial, breathable, of course, very sustainable, but we don't get too hippied out about it. Uh, it's just good functional stuff, good for you, good for the planet, whatnot, and uh, and and we just try to make some really interesting interesting and useful things. So I hope you go check that out because that does help support the show. That's at dsgear.com, dsgear.com. And like I said, you can find a link to that over at chrisodell.com as well. Thanks again for joining us. Be seeing you.